Thank you very much. Thanks for coming um, on this wonderful, cool evening with a hot topic for tonight's discussion. Um, Benjamin, uh, you, you've uh, actually added heat. You've actually <laughs> added heat. And it seems to be um, the way of, um, of culture that anything that has any kind of um, cause for discussion uh, gets labelled as provocation. <laughs> and uh, we've seen this erupt in recent times. But um, this beautiful book, which um, I've had the great um, pleasure to read, um, carries the title um, Dollar Dreaming. Um, and it's subtitled Inside the Aboriginal Art World. Um, ben, I was, um, of course, immediately struck by the title. Look, yes, the title in some ways is a provocation, uh, but I wanted to signal uh, some. I wanted to signal that this was a book about the market. I didn't want anybody to think that this was purely a book about art. In essence, this is a book about people, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that tonight, and hopefully we'll get into that a little bit later. But I wanted to signal that there was some kind of tension inherent in the Aboriginal art market, or at least the success of Aboriginal art in this country. And so sort of joining together the words dollar and dreaming, aside from the kind of um, the alliteration of the title, which means that it seems to roll off your tongue, it sort of gestured, I think, towards that tension that, I, that uh, runs through the book. Yeah. And um, in a way that spurred me in the first instance to get interested in this topic, because I'm not an expert on Aboriginal art. I'm a journalist. I was curious about the evolution of a market that didn't exist in 1972 and today is worth 400 or 500 million dollars mm. so in a way they're the sort of bookends of this book 1972 there is no market today it's half a billion dollars i was just curious as to how a market had evolved in that time and hopefully tonight we'll talk a little bit about how that market did evolve and 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 the book how the book tries to uh, answer that question mm. so there aren't many figures in the book um but those that are there are very telling um they say a lot in very few um, sentences. One of them, I think, is that uh, the Indigenous population is somewhere around the 2.5% of, yeah. of Australia's population, um, but the revenues um, or the, 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 the value of the market, um, the uh, Aboriginal art market, is about 70%. Um, so those two figures are at considerable variance with one another and I think probably um, invites us to see um, this term dollar um, in very tangible terms, but um, something that I noticed about the book is that um, the theme of the dollar uh, has a very, has great poignancy in sympathy with the people who are earning that dollar, yeah. um, that the dollar is not to be scorned as some kind of um, uh, sell, s selling out of the patrimony, but that it's necessary for uh, welfare. And I think you've um, made interventions at various levels concerned with that, with the, in fact, um, uh, enlightened but sometimes misguided uh, attempts to control the market. Yeah. Um, and this um, book does have, does touch on that. Yeah. I think that's one of the sort of paradoxes that runs through the Aboriginal art market. Robert was alluding to, I think, quite an interesting statistic. When you referred to figures, I think you were referring to statistical figures rather than people, um, just to clarify that point. And the figure that, uh, that he quoted was that the Aboriginal population is about 2.5% of the Australian population. And within that, they estimate there are about 6,000 artists, most of whom live in remote communities in the northwest and centre part of the country. But among those 6,000 artists, I guess, they that, well, that group of artists account for as much as 75% or three quarters of Australia's total art sales. So I think that's the statistic that he's alluding to, that a very, very small portion of artists in this country, Aboriginal artists, constitute three quarters of our nation's total art sales. So I think what we're looking at here is really an extraordinary f market phenomenon as much as an aesthetic and artistic one. Um, the second question, I guess, or the, the question that you were just asking me then was about, I guess, the imperatives to paint. And I think that there's a paradox there, um, one that, you know, I don't really have an answer to, but again, it's one that runs through the book. And it's a paradox between, I guess, the sort of private motivations and imperatives to paint that relate to tradition and spiritual stories 
and Aboriginal culture, and I guess the public commercial motivations. And I think that those two things, um, in the very best painters, are often aligned, but in many cases they're in conflict. And what I mean by that is uh, there is a sense in which, um, or a fear, that maybe the expectations of a market will change the kind of art that's produced. And I think that's happening all the time. It's happening around us, even in terms of the kinds of materials that artists use, the way in which uh, art advisors can enter a community and can, in a way, change the artistic output of that community, even if it's as sim simple as introducing acrylic paints, canvases to a community where they once painted on bark, or the introduction of, of a completely different art form, for instance, clay and pottery and things like that. So I think there are these tensions that run through the book, and, uh, and, and that's certainly one of them. And I guess also um, you're alluding to the issue of the immense need for wealth, for money. Um, it is the case that making art is one of the few ways in which Aboriginal people in remote communities can engage meaningfully with a market economy in this country. And so it's very difficult to be critical of Aboriginal painters producing artwork for the market when their need is so great, when they're often forced to um, provide for an extended family that can be as much as 50 or 60 people. So even if you have a successful painter in a community, that painter is often not only supporting the art centre itself, it's also through um, the percentage of their sales to return to that art centre, which are then used to foster and promote other artists, but the money that they earn is often used to support their family members, mm -hmm. which I think um, is one of the reasons why when those of you visit remote communities and you meet an artist who has a reputation in the art world, whose artwork sells for a tremendous amount of money and you see them living in conditions that would strike you and I as abject poverty, and it's not because they're not earning a lot of money, it's just that the people that live in that community have so little money, have so little access to money, that what money that is earned is just really, um, it just goes very, it doesn't go very far. Yes, yeah. Yeah, sure. um, part of the, the, the pleasure of this book um, for me is discovering those circumstances where the art is generated. And you've been, you're talking about yourself as a journalist, I think that's a little um, modest. Um, a book writer, um, that I think of as an author, um, is uh, going to very, um, very special locations and having very special encounters with people. And it's an amazing privilege. And then to read, the, to have access to it through reading, I think uh, we share that. Um, and I guess with Aboriginal art, especially, you know, from, from cold Melbourne, um, we always wonder about the, the proper level of scrupulosity, you know, where, where, the, where the ethics really cohere, given that we are far from it, almost, you know, in some sense, almost as far as New York. Yeah. Um, and the example that you gave, you, you were talking about the chain of influences and um, you mentioned just now the art advisor, and uh, there's a wonderful little passage in there where you, you describe, I'm sorry, I can't give you chapter and verse, you'll know yes. the, the passage immediately, but um, the uh, art advisor um, spoke quite shamelessly to one of these very senior artists and said, uh, you'll need more in that corner. Yeah, a bit of green. A bit of green. <laughs> Dutifully, that senior artist took up the advice. Yeah and presumably rectified the picture, which I thought was an amazing, um, you know, what seemed to, to, to me kind of preposterous. And yet the cue was received in, um, in, 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 you know, I guess a, an inclusive spirit. Um, it was part of their culture that someone would say that, I guess. Yeah. Um, that that, that um, may, may strike some people as almost a scandal uh, you wouldn't say that to Rembrandt, um, but maybe people did. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, you know, I am a journalist, and, and, and where I am at my best, I think, is reporting on what I see. And uh, this book is, is really a reportage of the people that I meet, the people that are involved in the Aboriginal art business, the people that have been involved in the Aboriginal art business. I try not to draw any judgments. I try to present different sides.
of, of each argument, and there are many, many sides to this whole industry and to this whole issue. And in fact, I think as we speak, Four Corners is airing a, uh, a documentary on um, on abuses, or what uh, alleged abuses in the uh, auction and the uh, sale market for Aboriginal art. So in a way, this book sort of ties in very much to issues that still seem very current and very alive. The, the, the issue that, or the kind of event that you're alluding to, in a way, um, it's an event that happened at the Arts Centre in Uendamu, and you know, I just report it as, as, as something that something that happens every day, and that is that the often the art advisors are in tremendously influential positions in remote communities to dictate not only the kind of um, media in which an artist works, but often the kind of the choice of colours, um, uh, and even in some cases the designs, and I think they have a tremendous responsibility and that's only one of their responsibilities in fact um, one of the art advisors is here this evening has spent many years in her community and she she could talk to this a lot better than i could in fact she's a character in the book um but you know i think the truth is that in many cases aboriginal artists in remote communities don't really have a sense of what sells or why mm. and one of the roles one of the many roles of art advisors in communities is to help advise them on how they can better interact with the market. And I think ultimately, if, if they're painting for the market, they can benefit tremendously from that advice. And it might necessarily have anything to do with the spiritual substance of the story. It can be more to do with technique and, and the, kind of, the kind of style or form or finish that's valued by, a, by, by a, an audience in Melbourne, for instance. And often, um, the advice really goes to that. Goes to that. Mm -hmm. I, I should I should declare my interest here that I, I, I have uh, certainly I don't share the um, the antipathy that is sometimes felt um, toward that level of interference in inverted commas uh, certainly um, studying Renaissance and Baroque you were, you know <laughs> strongly aware that artists were um, in, in, I, I wouldn't say being compromised because it can cut both ways I mean they can be inspired by the humanist advisor. Yeah. Um, and this would go straight to their content. Yeah. So in fact, the content was not quarantined in the Renaissance. Mm. Mm. Um, from from this influence, you know, the theologians and poets and so on would all contribute to this elaborate scheme. So I mean, uh, the fact that these uh, the, the art advisor may be outside the dreaming, may not have that privileged access, doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, he or she can't provide advice. And I think th this comes through very very yeah. very, very um, uh, eloquently. I think they're a conduit in a way. Um, it's funny, you know, one of the things I've done on a lot of radio interviews um, since the book's been published, you know, um, al almost 15, and one of the questions that comes up, um, aside from how I came to write the book, um, is this, just this question of sort of agency and, 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 and intervention, and I think it's an interesting one, and it's one um, that, you know, you you don't really have an answer for, but you, you strive to understand, and I think as, as a sort of a journalist, entering into remote communities, trying to find out what lies behind the pictures, what is the motivation to paint. You, you're also in a way changed yourself. And I think, you know, part of writing a book like this is also about being self-aware, about being what kind of impact you have on a community by being there as a journalist from a media organisation, um, what your expectations and responsibilities are. And I think, um, you know, it's something that I wasn't really aware of when I began visiting remote communities. I'm in a very privileged position. I've had the patronage and friendship for many years of an important Aboriginal artist, uh, sorry, uh, curator and writer, uh, John Mundine. And it's through him that I, over many years, have been able to travel to remote communities and have had access to Aboriginal people and, um, and through his contacts and through his guidance to be able to, you know, um, just look and listen and learn. And, and that experience, I think, changed me too. And, it also gave me a sense of um, the human dimension to this story. Um, when I began researching this book, I thought, yes, this is a story about how the Aboriginal art market has evolved. And I began interviewing people and traveling to communities um, with no real fixed idea in mind. And I did about 75, 80 interviews in five countries. And you know, I looked for some kind of thread. I looked for a rational purpose, some sense of historical trajectory. Um, and you know, it, there was none. Every person I talked to gave me a different answer. And in fact, I have a very good friend, the novelist Julia Lee, who's just, you know, written a new book called Disquiet. And she was teaching at Barnard College in New York, and I used to see her most days. And 
would talk about the manuscript and that I was working on. And she'd say to me, look, you know, you're crazy. You know, the irony is it took me a novelist to learn that all markets are irrational <laughs> in a way. And it was true. As soon as I stopped looking for some kind of rational purpose, I began to understand that the market for Aboriginal art had evolved through the actions of efforts of really the kind of a few key individuals that people in Australia and overseas had begun to look at this creativity differently. And it was by looking at it differently and that they'd come to exert, I guess, through their actions and attitudes, had come to exert an influence over a wider population. And that returns me, I guess, to this idea of it being a book about people. At that point, I knew that this was going to be a book about the people and the kind of, um, who actually just sort of started looking at this this stuff differently. And, and I'll give you some examples. One is a, a guy called Bob Edwards, who may or may not be known to you, but in the 1970s, he, you know, he's a, he was a kind of, basically a, a market gardener from Adelaide who was interested in Aboriginal uh, rock art and through that interest in the 50s and 60s he was involved in the Art Gallery of South Australia eventually became the first chair of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Board of the Australia Council. He established the entire art centre system as we know it mm -hmm. right, in the early 70s. He had a vision of that for that with the board established it. So basically built the infrastructure in the 1970s. He had an idea of what these communities could do. There was one Aboriginal um, art centre in the early 70s. There are now nearly 100 today. Another example of an individual, the story of a person who's talked about in the book is John Kluge. Those of you of a generation will know that in 1988-89, this is before Bill Gates, John Kluge was the richest man in the world. He owned um, a massive media company that owned Orion Pictures. They made Silences of the Lambs, Dances with Wolves. Um, they owned the Ice Capades, the Harlem Globetrotters, all these sort of once profitable franchises. And uh, he saw an exhibition at the Asia Society Museum in New York in 1989, a show called Dreamings, fell in love with the show and determined that he was going to collect Aboriginal art. He then, I guess, came out to Australia in a private jet with his wife and a curator from some museum. Um, they went to Ramangini, um, a small, tiny community in the Northern Territory, and in one afternoon they spent half a million dollars. And then over the next year or two, he proceeded to acquire almost 3,000 works of Aboriginal art. And his, I guess, his interest and enthusiasm for the art form, he kind of shook up a few old bigots in Australia, I think, in the late 80s. So I guess, in a way, that's an example of the way in which the actions of a few key individuals can exert an influence over a wider population. So in some ways, the book it kind of works off um, what you might call a tipping point theory to return to Malcolm Gladwell's book. Um, from a few years ago, uh, looking at the way in which trends or market trends can evolve through a few, what seem like a few insignificant actions from a few key individuals can actually create a kind of a whole market. Mm. And I think that's in a way what my argument is in this book, um, that you know, you look at the few key individuals in different places and different times. Um, because, you know, I'll give you another statistic. We read a lot in Aboriginal art books about the importance of Jeff Barden, his role for, uh, in establishing the acrylic painting movement at Papunya in the early 70s. You look at the stock books, stock books at mm -hmm. Papunya Tola, and you'll find that the total art sales, absolutely everything they sold each year, never exceeded $35,000 until the early 80s. Okay? So after 10 years after he left Papunya Tola, they weren't selling any more than they had in the first year. Something changed in the 1980s. And in fact, the story of the evolution of the Aboriginal art market is actually a story of the 1980s. Something changed in this country. People began to look at Aboriginal creativity differently. It wasn't until 1980 that the first work of an Aboriginal artist goes into the National Gallery of Australia collection, goes into the Art Gallery of South Australia. You know, it's not until 82, 83 that the total sales of Papania Tula art suddenly begin to increase and exponentially. And really, by the time of the bicentenary in 1998, Australia seemed to have done a complete backflip in its relationship to Aboriginal art. Suddenly, it was being embraced as part of our national identity and imagery. So in a way, I was trying to find individuals that had been instrumental in that change. Yes. Yeah. Well, ben, I was very interested in your motives for writing the book. Um, and for a reader, um, you, you look for signs in the texture of the of the of the writing. Um, one of the things that jumps out at you, and it's even it even registers in the design, 
um, that um, you're composing the book in vignettes and a lot of that has to do with this interest in people. Mm. But you come to people, you hear their story, you record it. You then move on to the implications that that might have for you on a, on a philosophical level, on an economic level, uh, historically. Uh, and you wax and wane, you're, you're on the road, we're on the road, um, you know, you get the dust, it's very atmospheric often, um, and then in the margin, um, separating the pack, the um, paragraphs, there'll be these tracks, you know, and then you'll be you'll be onto onto another onto another element there that um, feeds into further scrutiny of the theme at another level. Um, and so it seemed to me that this um, uh, working on on a couple of levels, many levels, uh, revealed something of your motives in writing the text. Yeah. I mean, I can't take credit for the design of the book. It was designed by Tricia Garner, and I want to thank her for that. She did a beautiful job. <laughs> and um, she's won all kinds of awards too, so it's no surprise it's a beautiful book. And, um, you know, Hardy Ground Books also did a terrific job with the production. Um, yes, I mean, I think, you know, to try and make sense of this, what we're talking about is a historical time frame of about 30 years. Um, we're talking about dozens of communities in different parts of the world. We're talking about multiple languages. We're talking about shifting from an artist producing an artwork to a billionaire collector um, looking to buy one of those works as a trophy for a Fifth Avenue foyer. So I think structurally, when you sort of put all of that into a kind of a sort of into a sort of book soup, trying to find a uh, trying to find a coherent narrative, uh, trying to find some kind of trajectory through which to tell the book, was very difficult and I think what I determined again was to go back to the people and to tell their story and as you say to try to tease out some of the broader implications of their actions to try to build up a picture an overall picture of the way in which a market emerges in some senses you know it's funny you, you, you mentioned that Baroque um, in some sense this is an old-fashioned book because it sort of it, it documents an area of sort of social history mm the birth of an art movement sure. in a way that I'm not sure art historians do so much anymore. In a way, you, you're sort of taking a social milieu and you're trying to, in a way, document the people that inhabit that. So in some ways, it's almost like a sort of secret history of the last 30 years. Well, well yes, I mean, it's a big picture. And this is what, this is what excites me, that, um, you know, so often academic discourse is fragmenting. Mm. What you're doing is building up. And, and through a lot of contrasts that bring out something that's intrinsic to this field, and that is paradox. Yeah. You know, the paradox of that you sort of bring out just by evoking the Sotheby's building on the Upper East Side, <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, you're, you're there with your feet sinking into the carpet yeah. as opposed to the dust. And um, so that these, these paradoxes work in such beautiful ways. Um, but can I just leave my contribution with just one delightful anecdote that I just have to read out? Um, because it's actually um, from some source material that Ben has dug out um, concerning uh, Francoise uh, uh, Dussart, who was an anthropologist, and uh, this anecdote is so beautiful, I, I just wanted to read it, um, uh, because um, she was um, going with um, um, an Aboriginal artist. I'll, I'll read, I'll read it, it's, it's, it's actually uh, better in Ben's words. Um, the, story, the story always gives me pause, for it enables us to glimpse the cultural frame that Aboriginal people have grown up in. Françoise was visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York with Yuan de Mu painter Dolly Nampajimpa during a US tour of an exhibition of Aboriginal art. When the artist turned and asked her if the scenes of dancing women in paintings by Edgar Degas depicted religious stories or ceremonies of some kind, Françoise explained that these dancers were in fact entertainers performing for paying visitors. Dolly guffawed. Well, then, these aren't important paintings. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we're getting the uh, wrap it up symbol, but look, I just want to very quickly hand it over to Robert, who's going to wrap it up. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for, for this wonderful opportunity to get into your mind in talking uh, about this wonderful book. You mentioned that you had 
um, written it with your mother in mind. I always write with my mother in mind. And I will be buying a copy for my mother. Ben Rimmer, thank you very much for talking tonight.